Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. Uh, recently, I spoke with you uh, about uh, suggestions for worried teenagers. Well, here I'm going to turn to trying to ameliorate common worries of somebody a little bit older, person ready to start out in adulthood, who's just out of school, undergraduate or graduate, graduate or not. Well, first, whether you need them or not, here are a few words of commiseration. It may well be harder to start out today than when I was your age. Job requirements seem to have been ratcheted up and pay has gone down, if not in absolute dollars, in the expectation that you're going to work long hours or that they make you work part-time, temp with few benefits so that your net income by the end of the year is pretty low. Romantic relationships seem more fraught because of the race and gender tensions, the political polarization, and the expectation that even marriage may last through thick, but maybe not through thin. Then there are expectations that are less prevalent, uh, in uh, that were less prevalent in previous generations. In some circles, uh, people turn their noses down to you if you merely want a stable job and don't expect to change the world. With respect to those challenges that the younger generation is facing, here are some thoughts on how to survive and yeah, maybe even thrive. First, regarding launching your career. I used to often encourage a lot of people to become self-employed, but I've become less sanguine about self-employment. Regulations and competition have increased and empirically, I've seen too high a percentage of startups shut down, even when they're led by graduates from top universities. Not so much that the universities made them smart, but these were, you have to be pretty smart to get in, pretty dogged in most cases. Anyway, across the 6,000 career counseling clients I've had, plus my friends, it seems that except for stars, I'll call them shooting stars, ambitious stars, the people who are happiest have a stable job in a quality company or nonprofit or a government agency that's carefully selected to defy the stereotype that government is inefficient. To land such a job requires more than persistence. I've seen people send out hundreds of applications and gotten Zippo. While the government reported so-called unemployment rate is low, the percentage of people with rewarding, full-time, benefited, reasonably stable jobs is also low. To break through the brick wall, the following is what works best for my clients. When answering advertised jobs, your resume and cover letter has to make clear that you really are well suited for the position. If you're not, don't bother replying. You're going to waste time and energy. You don't want to run out of gas before you reach the finish line. Include a piece of what I call collateral material. It's usually either a work sample or a one or two page bullet centric paper that proves you have the chops to do the job well. My favorite title is something like five keys to success and blah, whatever it is you're the job you're trying to, the career you're trying to aspire to in the year 2022 and beyond or something like that. And where possible, and this is often crucial, send an email or a text or phone call to everyone you know who might know someone at that place of employment and ask if they could put in a good word for you, even if it's just a quick email to the HR department. I heard that, for example, Jane Doe is applying for a position at your company. You might find it helpful to know she's terrific and then insert that person should insert one or two attributes that the job ad seems to really prioritize, care most about. As you probably know, many positions are not advertised, so ask for job leads from everyone who likes you. Also, cold contact target employers, explaining why it might be worth their chatting with you about a possible job, even if they don't currently have an opening. Do wear your armor of against rejection, the usual response to such queries is no response, but all you need is one good lead. Now I want to say a few words about getting serious about relationships. If you've gotten the quick hookup, quick hookup thing out of your system and are ready for a more beautiful relationship, here are some thoughts. Do take these with grains of salt. I'm 71 years old and I've been with my wife 49 years. And although I've had a lot of young clients and success with them, uh, I'm probably rather out of touch. It is impossible to reduce what's desirable in a relationship to a few words, but I feel confident that if your partner deserves at least a B on these report card items, it bodes well. They're well adjusted, kind, intelligent, income earning in a rewarding job. Uh, your guys have enduring sexual compatibility and that ineffable thing called love. 
That often manifests by feeling good, even just being in the same room with the person. We all deserve that, and if you feel you don't, what baby steps could you take to improve yourself? To get a fine and compatible romantic partner, you need to do more than wait for the right pizza delivery person to knock on your door. On the apps, reach out to only seemingly compatible prospects, really quite compatible prospects, because there's a lot of fish in the sea, and cut your losses. If you guess wrong, I mean, if you know, if you cut your loss, if you guess wrong. Also, tell all your respected friends the kind of person you're looking for. Also, where would you guess that your Mr. or Ms. Wright would likely be found? In a certain class, of course, you know, a volunteer activity, a party thrown by a friend with quality friends, you know, the friend who's got quality friends, whatever. But beware bars. The noise, the alcohol, and the quickie mentality is a perfect storm for highly imperfect relationships. So now a word about your money. Don't let money excessively drive what job to take. After taxes, the difference is unlikely to be great. Not great enough to change your lifestyle. More important is that your job be a launch pad toward a rewarding career that uses your strengths and skirts your weaknesses. But what do you do with your money? Um, err on the side of investing rather than spending. Learn sooner than later that spending more than minimally yields you too little benefit and impresses people not worth caring to impress. Also, anything you invest when you're young rather than spend um, has more years for the miracle of compounding to make you much more money than you probably would think without lifting a finger. For example, if you were 21 when you started putting 100 bucks a month into a standard 7% yielding investment such as a S&P 500 ETF, if you don't know what that is, Google it, um, and you're, say, 60 today, with that just 100 bucks a month, you would have accumulated more than a quarter of a million dollars thanks to compounding. Of course, as the commercials say, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Now a word about your physical health. When you're young, I think the most important thing for me to talk about is your weight. As you get older, it's much harder to lose weight. Better to take that college 10 or 20 off now. Perhaps nothing other than tobacco, alcohol, or other substance abuse will affect your health more. It's common knowledge that most young people don't think much about aging, or let alone dying. But take it from an old guy, you're going to care. To get in the habit of eating moderately. You will thank me, really. Now a word about your mental health. Young adults, maybe because of the stresses that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, are suffering higher rates of anxiety and depression. Episodic efforts to control your stress, such as meditating or vacations from where I sit, are less likely to enduringly help than to put yourself in environments and with people where you feel relatively comfortable and you have a measure of control. For example, a job that's only moderately challenging and with a boss who's not a micromanager. Be with friends and romantic partners that don't unduly deprive you of your agency. And even if you're an extrovert, give yourself some alone time when you can do just what you want with no worry of what anyone thinks or wants. Finally, adopt the core principle of cognitive behavioral therapy. It is fine to want things, but you can't demand they occur. You can't control everything. So do what you can, then let go and move on to the next thing as best as you can. A word about substance abuse. Another thing I'm hoping you, you got out of your system is substance abuse. Long rampant with alcohol and now with legal weed, you have twice the easy and legal options for getting in trouble. As I've uh, written often, the latest science finds that marijuana may be more dangerous than even alcohol. And just this week, fellow Psychology Today blogger, <clears throat> Dr. Tim and Cermak wrote uh, something called Cannabis and Psychosis. When there appears to be a link. And finally, a bit about spirituality, whether it be secular or religious. The fastest growing religion is no religion, but people still want more than the day to day. Some people find spirituality in work that's contributory, others in work and or parenthood, still others in organized religion. Whatever your spiritual source, fan its flames, it is important to the life well led. As in many of my little talks with you, I offer a buffet of suggestions, and that can be overwhelming. So, as an antidote, is there one or two of this little talk suggestions that you would like to try? In any event, I do thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco. I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments, and especially like if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. 
in any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.